Welcome back to the last lecture video for chapter six. We'll have a couple of example problem videos from this section, um, but otherwise the chapter is pretty much wrapped up. So this section talks about the force of gravity equation in a more universal way. In chapters four and five, we were using the idea of weight as m times little g, but it's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, and we're going to make sure we understand, um, we're going to understand that idea. So the appendix slides that we've mentioned a couple of times at this point, and um, we'll see a couple more mentions of it here. There are some reminders that Galileo, who we talked about um, throughout chapter um, two and four, uh, that Galileo was essential to building up the foundation of understanding before Newton even came on the scene. But we did mention Newton's major life achievements in chapter four. The first one here discovered the three laws of motion. That is our chapter four toolkit. The law of inertia, F net equals MA, and the idea that forces balance each other, equal and opposite forces, is something we mentioned in chapter four, and it shows up as a concept for us um, in ideas but we'll be using it in a quantitative way off in chapter eight. The second major life achievement that we listed back in chapter four was that he discovered the universal law of mutual gravitation. That's what we'll be talking about in this lecture video. And then the third one invented calculus. We still don't care about calculus here in physics 125, our algebra-based physics. Sorry, Newton, um, but it's still pretty impressive. All right. So the law, the universal law of gravitation, fancier way of saying the um, law of gravity, is based on the fact that when we think about gravity, that can actually be a force that exists between any two masses. Back in chapter four, when we talked about weight or the force of gravity there, the masses involved were the small object we were drawing a free body diagram for and the Earth. And so rather than having to look up the mass of the Earth and plug things into this big equation, we saved it until this chapter. And the reason why it matters to us is because orbits, which are circles, or close enough to circles for our purposes, are happening because of this force of gravity. So the capital G here, we must recognize, is not the same thing as the lowercase g from the earlier chapters. This capital G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, a lot of messy um, units attached to it. We don't have to memorize any of that. That will be on the equation sheet. Um, but it is something we have to recognize is not just 9.8. So the only requirement for gravity to act on an object is that that object has to have mass and there must be some other mass in the universe. Right now, there is a force of gravity between you, the person watching, and me, the person talking, but we have relatively small masses, our distance is probably quite large, and that g value is 10 to the minus 11. So it's a very, very small force that we don't even notice, but it is there. So if we want to think about, um, and the bottom of this slide, by the way, is just kind of in words, that same um, equation is, is what's shown here above. So if we want to think about a real world example of this being applied to the force between two small objects, let's think about two people that are standing two meters apart, okay, social distancing, and um, they have masses of 60 kilograms and 90 kilograms. So we want to calculate the force of gravity between those two people. So pause the video if you can, because I'd really like you to try plugging this into your calculator on your own. That way we can see if there's any sticking points that we want to recognize before we just kind of see the answer show up. So pause the video if you're able. All right. So there's no trick here. This isn't a complicated equation. We plug in the numbers that we have, g, times mass one, times mass two. Some students get confused because it looks like G's out front of everything. And while that is true, that also means it's um, multiplying the top half of everything 
Most common mistake is students do not square the radius. That is going to be absolutely essential for us. And we end up with a force that is um, a billionth of a Newton. We won't notice it. So although two people in a room could feel attracted to each other, it is not gravitational attraction. All right. So what does have a substantial force of gravity? Well, planet-sized objects certainly do. The Earth has a mass of almost 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. That's a pretty big object, and that's why we do experience that force of gravity, because our mass times that mass can create a large number. So use the Earth's mass here and the Earth's radius here and plug that into your calculator to get what that force looks like using this new force of gravity equation. Okay, so I'm going to um, bring up the answer in just a second, but if you have a result, if you pause the video and have a result, also do the simpler chapter 4 idea of this person's mass, 70 kilograms, times g, 9.8, and we will get 686 newtons. When we plug in the more complex um, numbers, lots of scientific notation, lots more stuff to multiply together, we get 685.9 newtons, which to three significant digits rounds to the exact same value that we were using all throughout chapters four and five. So the force of gravity that we have been using is simply saying that when we have objects on the surface of Earth that have this weight to them, the universal law of gravitation is in effect. The mass that we are comparing to or feeling the force from is the Earth. And the distance between that object and the center of the Earth is pretty much just the radius of the Earth. And so those numbers can all get multiplied together and you will get 9.8 from that understanding. But the key thing is that the full equation here on the right for the force of gravity that isn't specific to the Earth can now be used for any pair of objects. The moon circling the Earth at a much larger distance than just the Earth's radius. Two stars orbiting each other far off on the other side of the galaxy. Any of these situations we now are able to get the force of gravity for and we're not just stuck on the surface of Earth. But we need to bring it back around to why this matters. When we think about objects in orbit, orbits are able to be circles. They are also ha able to have a shape called an ellipse, which we aren't going to get into in this particular course. You may have seen in a previous math class. Um, but it's worth recognizing that these objects are going around in circles because the force of gravity is constantly trying to pull them um, to the Earth. If we think about the cannonball example here in the upper right, a cannonball that isn't shot fast enough is just going to be a projectile motion problem. It will, it will fall into the ocean. If we have it shot faster, it will go further before it um, falls into the ocean. And if we shoot it fast enough, it will continue to fall around the Earth, being constantly pulled back into the circle through centripetal acceleration ideas until it gets back to where it started and now it has a stable orbit. So the key idea here is if we have an object that is in orbit around something, then the only force acting on it is gravity, and that can be the thing we put in instead of net force. So on the left here, instead of net force, we have written the force of gravity, and instead of acceleration, we have written the centripetal acceleration. This equation here on the slide is not something that will show up by itself like this on our equation sheet, but it uses our understanding of F net equals MA, 
our understanding of centripetal acceleration, and this new idea for the full force of gravity, which will be on our equation sheet. We will see how this is used in problem solving um, in two separate full example problems. This first one here where we have a 70 kilogram satellite, we will comment on the fact that the gravitational force is not significantly smaller than when it's on the surface. That's a common misconception about how gravity works in space. We'll comment on that and then we will do some um, circle, circular motion ideas that look very similar to what we had talked about earlier in the chapter. This example here is another one that we will be um, handling. What we will hopefully see is that this is a very similar example to the previous one, example 6G, but there's less holding your hand to get to the final answer. This one is asking how long it takes to go once around the Earth. The previous example forces you to find the gravitational force. It helps you to recognize that that's going to help you get the tangential speed. And then finally, we'll be able to use um, that tangential speed to find the time period it takes to go once around. This is cutting out those middle steps and expecting you to be able to recognize how to get from point A to point B. What that means is example 6G is good to understand these new ideas. Example 6H is good to test that understanding, for example, at test time. This would be a better way of asking a test question than the previous example. We're showing you both, but it would be worth understanding that in order to answer this question, we have to go through the same steps that we did in the previous example. We're just not explicitly asking for those steps. Now, it is worth noting that this capital G 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, it did have to come from somewhere. It was actually experimentally determined. And if you are interested in this, um, I highly recommend looking up um, Cavendish's experiment where he used the fact that any two small masses do have a force of gravity between them to figure all of that out. I'm not going to go into the details because that's not part of our curriculum and it will take a little bit longer than I really have um, set aside for this section. But it is really impressive to recognize that two small masses, even though the gravity force may be very, very small, it is enough to have an effect if you've balanced everything else and that's the only force causing some motion. So kind of cool. The most important concept that we need to make sure we leave this section with is that when we have an astronaut in orbit, they are not weightless. They absolutely have a force of gravity acting on them, and that is why they are in orbit. And the force of gravity is extremely high still. It is almost the same. It is maybe a 10 to 15 percent drop compared to on Earth versus in um, the kinds of orbits that we put astronauts in. And so this idea that you are weightless and floating around is simply a case of free fall. The same idea of being weightless, if you are skydiving or if you're in one of the um, rides at amusement parks that drop you very quickly, you feel weightless briefly. That is simply because the normal forces acting on you have gone away and our feeling of weight is based on the forces that are applied to our bodies and not some fundamental change. So when an astronaut is floating around in any video you might see from the International Space Station, that is simply because they are falling around the Earth in the same kind of way that the International Space Station is falling around the Earth. And so there aren't strong normal forces acting on them. One of the coolest videos that shows this free fall phenomenon is from a group called OK Go. So their music videos are always um, very highly technical and, and interesting to watch. But their music video for Upside Down and Inside Out uses an airplane that astronauts also use to um, train that goes up so that everyone's pressed into their seats really, really um, a lot, really, really a lot, whatever. 
<laughs> pressed into their seats, and then it drops. So that as the plane drops, you are falling in the same way as the plane around you, and you get to act weightless. That music video is a great example of it. I highly recommend looking it up or clicking the link in the posted slides. They also have a behind the scenes so you can kind of see what's going on for how that works. Um, but I, I highly recommend watching it. The most important thing I can make sure we come away with is that there are a lot of misconceptions about how gravity works in space. And we need to make sure to confront those misconceptions, otherwise we will get stuff wrong in this section because we are just defaulting to these incorrect ideas. There is absolutely still a very strong force of gravity um, on astronauts that are in orbit, and it is a very um, similar amount of gravity to what they experience on the ground. And we'll see that in the two example problem videos, uh, but it's worth saying in words multiple times so that we recognize that if we've got some incorrect ideas that we pull those out of our brain to make room for the correct ideas. So that's it for this section and it's it for chapter six. I want to point out here that I've mentioned this set of appendix slides a couple of times throughout the lecture videos. This is a list of what is in those appendix slides if you recognize you might want to go check out a particular topic. It is worth reading through them once briefly. You don't have to fully understand some of the stuff. This is a mix of extra number problems that are a little bit more difficult or we just don't have time for to cover um, in, our, uh, in our lecture videos. Um, a couple of things that are interesting topics that we just don't touch on um, in our curriculum. So angular size is one of those that on campus we normally cover but we're limiting our focus as best we can to cover the key ideas in more detail. Um, and then satellites and Kepler's laws, for example, I cover that very significantly in my astronomy classes, but it's not a core part of our Physics 125 curriculum. So I've included a couple of slides, but it isn't something that we're gonna be testing you on. Anything that only shows up in this appendix will not show up on a test. We're not trying to be sneaky and like hide a key question in there um, that is going to be points based. Um, but it, it is something that's kind of useful and it, it doesn't take too much to just read through them briefly. As always, if you have questions, please reach out. Um, and otherwise, you'll see the next two um, example video problems for the gravity examples. And then we'll be done with the chapter. So thanks for listening.